So if uh, we can, let's give um, Andrew Chang a warm welcome. Thank you. Good morning. How's everybody? Uh, I got to tell you, this class starts early. Uh, and it is really freezing outside. <laughs> so you guys are all troopers for being here. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. I'm excited to be sharing some time with you guys. Um, is this? Oh, oh thank you. Sorry. Yeah. So as it's warming up, I'll give you guys a quick introduction on myself. Thank you for doing that a little bit already. Uh, my name is Andrew Chang. Uh, what I'm doing currently for work is I work at LinkedIn as an enterprise relationship manager on the talent solutions team. We have a few different business units at LinkedIn. Um, one of them is our sales solutions team. And what we do on that team is we help sales teams find uh, people that they can sell to lead generation. We also have what we call a marketing solutions team. And they help marketing teams with B2B and B2C marketing, digital advertising on LinkedIn.com. And then we have my team, which is the largest team that we have, probably with the service and products that most people interact with, um, things like jobs and careers and things like that. That's a talent solutions team. So as a relationship manager, what I do is I work with talent acquisition and HR teams like Marie's team at Arrow Hive and help them find and connect and eventually hire all the best candidates out there, okay? <laughs> um, so you guys are all here, obviously, because you guys have an interest in HR and talent acquisition. That's why Marie had asked me to come in and talk about something that we at LinkedIn feel is very important, which is employer branding and also your personal professional brand. Um, so that's what I'll go over with you guys. Sorry, technical difficulties. See that works. Boom. Okay. Okay, um, so that's what we'll cover today, employer branding, right? Um, before we get into that, I thought it'd be helpful if we just start with consumer branding, um, just because I think that's a little bit easier as a concept to grasp, because that's the stuff that we interact with every day, right? We already start talking about that with the different brands that you guys are wearing right now. Um, and once we understand how consumer branding works, then employer branding is gonna be super easy to get. And we'll talk a little bit more about your personal and your professional brands too. I know that a lot of you guys are graduating soon. You guys are gonna be on the market to try to find jobs and careers soon. So building your personal and your professional brand is gonna be a very important step in helping you guys do that. Um, and then we'll take quite a bit of time, probably about like the last 30 minutes or so, where we'll have a live working session and we can actually help you guys build out your LinkedIn profiles. Um, so is there anything that you guys don't see on here that you wanna make sure I cover, Marie? Okay. Um, the other thing is I love questions, right? So don't be shy. If you guys have questions as we want to do this stuff, feel free to shout them out. Um, if you see something that you want more information on, definitely feel free to let me know. And I can send this back to you guys too, that we can share with the class. Um, so don't feel like you guys have to take notes on everything. Um, okay, so let's start with consumer branding. What is consumer branding and why is it so important? Well, marketing teams for every company out there are trying to build a brand around their product every single day with the goal of trying to get us as consumers to purchase that product right so if we take any consumer brand any product out there american eagle jeans or trader joe's water coca-cola for instance right their marketing teams are trying to build a story they're trying to build a brand around that product to make that product compelling for us as consumers to purchase right now there's a bunch of different ways that marketing teams do that. The method that we probably interact with the most every day is advertising, right? 
print ads, commercials, TV ads, radio, different things like that. Um, can you guys think of anything else? Maybe like uh, product placement in movies is one that I see a lot recently. Um, social, Facebook, Twitter, and things like that. Celebrity endorsements is another one, right? So there's a bunch of different like strategies and tactics that these marketing teams use to influence what we call our purchase decisions, right? But the one overarching objective that these marketing teams are trying to do with all these different strategies is to influence our path to purchase. What I mean by path to purchase is a path that any consumer takes when they decide to purchase a product. So if we take a consumer who is on the far left of this kind of like diagram right here, this path to purchase diagram, we're thinking about a consumer who has not considered buying Coca-Cola or American Eagle jeans at all. What a marketing team is trying to do is to make that consumer aware that American Eagle jeans exist, right? And then from there, they want to pepper them with all these different kinds of advertising, right? Different kinds of placements on Facebook, social, commercials, and things like that to get that consumer interested in their product. And they then want to continue moving that consumer all the way down this path to purchase until they eventually, hopefully, become a customer, right? So, why is it so important? I mean, obviously, these marketing teams want people to buy their product, right? But there's a reason why modern marketers have to focus so much on this path of purchase. Um, can anyone take a guess to why that is? I'll give you guys a hint. It has to do with choice. There's too many competitors. There's so much choice that you have to have a good brand to keep that customer coming back. That's exactly it, okay? I have <laughs> participation writing, so <laughs> thank you. I got gift cards, Amazon, Starbucks, iTunes. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Andrew, every hand is gonna be raised now. <laughs> All right. What are you gonna go with that movie, music? Uh, no, my movie was my kids. They love iTunes. Oh, okay, awesome, nice. So that's exactly right. It's because we as consumers now have the power to choose what products we want to consume, right? And there's so many different brands out there on the market. You have Gap jeans, Banana Republic jeans, you have Abercrombie. There's a reason why you chose American Eagle, right? And that's what these marketers are thinking about every day. How do we get people to purchase our product over any of the other products in the market? It wasn't always like this, though. If we think back to consumer products, let's say, as far as 100 years ago, right? There's been a dramatic shift in power in that dynamic, right, on the uh, consumer landscape. Whereas before, long time ago, it was the manufacturers who had the power. If you think about a company like Coca-Cola, been around for a while, um, I just looked them up yesterday, I think it was like 1890 or something like that, right? When they first came out, likely, I, I don't know this for sure, but I'm guessing they were the only cola out on the market. So there was no choice, right? They were the people who had the power to dictate what the prices were, who would consume their product, where it would be sold, right? And then what happened? Population started to increase, cities were built, all these like epicenters where people could buy things, and then these mega retailers popped up, like a Walmart, a Target, Safeway. And then these retailers started to control the power, right? They're like the distribution centers. They decide who's on the shelf, what price it sold at, what we're gonna buy as consumers. Uh, and now we're at work. We're at a place where us as consumers, we have the power, right? Largely due to the internet technology, because we have the power to buy things at our fingertips. We can buy those jeans, we can buy any other jeans, I can buy Coca-Cola, I can buy any other beverage I want. We have the power to choose, which is super important. So that's why these digital marketers, every day, they have to craft a story around their product to make that product compelling for us to purchase over any other competitive product on the market, right? And any consumer, marketing team that's doing a good job at this is doing these four things. And I want you to try to remember these four things. If there's anything you guys like have to take away with you today, it's these four things right here. As you guys are trying to build your personal and your professional brand, this is also what you want to think about. They're trying to build a presence. They're trying to increase the reach to their audience. They're trying to increase their exposure and then engage their audience, whether it's consumers or for you guys as professionals, potential employees, right? 
All this makes sense? Any questions? Okay, so let's think about some of the more famous consumer brands out there, big ones, and think about that story that they're trying to tell us. So if you think about Coca-Cola, what's their deal? Like refreshing, right? Share Coca-Cola with your friend. Classic. Yes, right? Good drink to have. Um, what about Volvo? Right. No one got that last time. That was a good one. Cool. <laughs> Gift card? <laughs> that was easy, right? You guys got to participate. Amazon, Starbucks? Okay. Um, McDonald's. <laughs> Wait, we can raise our hand? <laughs> you don't have to. Oh, okay, okay. Um, is it I'm loving you? What's that? I'm loving you. Yeah, that's their tagline. Yeah. Um, but what do you think about when you think about McDonald's? Uh, I think about cheap fast food. Cheap fast food. <laughs> Perfect. Oh, uh, yes. Um, I'll tell you this right now. McDonald's could do like zero advertising and all. I'd still be there twice a week. Especially on like Friday night, one in the morning. <laughs> it's delicious. Um, what about the beers? This is a favorite of mine because I think it is possibly the most successful marketing branding campaign, uh, campaign in history. Um, what do you guys usually think about when you think about the beers? Can I guess? Luxury? Luxury, diamonds. Um, what do most people think about? Well, what do I think about? I think maybe, because um, I just got married recently. When you think about diamonds, engagement the engagement ring, right? Why do you think that is? because they have one of the biggest marketing campaigns for uh, jewelry and engagement rings. Right. That's exactly it. Um, I'll tell you this right now, the whole concept of like the surprise engagement, making a big deal out of it, that's not something that we've traditionally done as a culture, but that's something that De Beers actually manufactured, right? To try to get us to, to sell more diamonds, right? Traditionally what happened was, when a couple was getting engaged, that couple would go into the jewelry store together to pick out a memento, right, to signify the engagement. But De Beers, with their market research, they found out that it was usually the woman who was the more sensible one, the more brutal one. So when they went in as a couple, it was the man who wanted to spend more. The woman would say, you know what, let's save this money, not spend too much on the rain, put it down for whatever house, whatever it is, right? Um, so what did the beers do about that? They got rid of the woman. Yeah. <laughs> right? Yeah. Right? They also helped perpetuate that three month salary rule. Right, they did that too. Three months salary, surprise engagement. Now what do people do? People go into the jewelry store, I men do, right? Um, and they buy the right diamond engagement ring on their own. Woman's not there. The beers has created that for us because they knew that when that happens, the man's gonna spend more money, they can sell more diamonds, right? Does anybody know? Sorry. No, no go I ahead. I have a question. Yeah. I'm actually, because I recently just got engaged and I've been reading that it's changing. So what do you think the beers is gonna do about that? That's a good question. I'm sure they're, they're very smart. I'm sure they're gonna do something. <laughs> I don't know. Um, that's a good question. I really don't know. But I mean, marketing changes mm -hmm. as consumers change, right? Um, with different eras, whatever it is. So good marketers always have to kind of like keep up with whatever changes there are. So if there's a shift in us as consumers, we may not want to be buying diamonds anymore. We may want to buy, let's say, another jewel or show some other way to signify um, an engagement or a love for someone, then I'm sure they're going to find a way to adapt to that. Good question. Though. Um, does anybody know what the beer's tagline is? A diamond is? Forever. Forever, forever right. You know why that is? Damn expensive. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> so another thing that the beer is manufactured, right? And the reason is because there's two sources where we get <coughs> diamonds from. One is the beers because they control most of the world's distribution of diamonds, and the other is us as people because we all have diamonds. Diamonds don't decrease in value, right? So what does the beers do to control the distribution? There's only one other distribution point, which is the people. They sell this marketing line that diamond is forever, so that we hold on to our diamonds forever. We pass it along to our kids, to our grandchildren. So we don't flood the secondary market, meaning we don't resell our diamonds, and that way it would drag down the value, right? 
So by doing that, they've controlled the distribution of these diamonds to keep them rare and to keep their prices up so that they made more money, right? This is like marketing genius. I mean, incredible, hugely successful. Um, and I think us as marketers all admire this marketing campaign that De Beers has done over the past 50 years, right? Pretty cool stuff. So now that we understand how powerful consumer branding is, right, and how it works, I think it'll be a lot easier to understand employer branding, right? <coughs> Just like consumer branding, employer branding, talent acquisition and HR teams like Marie's team at Barrow High, they're trying to do one thing, which is influence any candidates have to hire, right? They want to make sure that they, if they have a superstar candidate here in Silicon Valley, these days, that's going to be software engineers, right? Um, who else, Marie? Software engineers. Who else is like hot on the market right now? Sales um, um, people. Big data. Big data analytics. Big data like, analytics. Okay, cool. Yeah. Um, so they want to do everything they can to make sure that these superstar big data employees, these software engineer employees, come to work at Arrowhive or whatever company they're working for instead of any of their competitive companies, right? And how do they do that? By influencing the path to hire, right? And just like consumer branding, there's a lot of different tactics and strategies that they can use to make that happen. Advertising, um, building out their pages on LinkedIn, building their presence with their own company webpage, right? They have to craft a story on why any kind of candidate would want to work at their company over Google, Amazon, whatever it is. And how do they do that? Well, oh, you know what? Let's talk about the shipping power too, right? Because that's important. And that's a huge, uh, a huge piece in where we are at today in terms of like the landscape of talent acquisition. So if we think about who had the power in the employment landscape, let's say as recently as 10 years ago, it was companies that had the power, right? They had the power to dictate where the jobs were, how much people were getting paid, when they would come to work, what they were offered for benefits, right? And I'd say as recently as the past 10 years, there's been a dramatic shift where now it's us, right? Us as employees that have the power, right? Would you say 10 years is pretty accurate maybe when that change happened? Maybe even more recently, maybe like five years or something like that, right? Where we as employees now have so that's why this employer branding piece is so important, right? Because we know that any of these consumers out there, I'm sorry, any of these candidates out there, these potential job candidates, can choose from any of these companies that they want. So I'll tell you guys an interesting story. I actually did a profile build out session for a group of software engineers um, a few months ago. And there's about a group of five of them, and they all had out of everything that we covered, they all had the same question for me, which was, how do I turn off LinkedIn messaging, right? The reason they wanted to turn it off is because they thought it was annoying because they get hit up by recruiters with job offers like five times every single day, right? That's the power of choice. They have the power to choose any job that they want. Can you imagine getting hit up by so many recruiters for jobs that you're like, this is annoying. I've never been in that situation myself, but I imagine it'd be pretty awesome, right? Um, and that's why Marie and her team at Arrowhive, talent acquisition teams at Google, any other companies out there, are trying to build this story, right? To make their company a compelling place to work. And how are they doing that? Um, are they an industry leader? That's an important one, I think, for candidates these days. What are the perks and benefits? Another important one, right? Especially here where we are in Silicon Valley, perks and benefits are huge. Everybody knows about the perks and benefits that Google has. What the culture is, it's a fun place to work. Um, I don't know if any of you guys have been shopping around for potential employers recently, but if you go to their sites, a lot of them have pictures of their office, ping pong tables, pool tables, video games, whatever it is. Um, has anyone here been to your office, Marie? Yes, there are a few. Okay, cool. It's an awesome office. Brand new. Um, it's a beautiful place to work. Um, compensation is another big one, right? How much are we going to pay you? 
right? So all these things affect the employer brand and influences the path to hire for any of these potential candidates, right? And these same four things are the things that any of the top talent acquisition teams are focusing on to make sure that their employer brand is strong. Again, they're trying to build a presence, they're reaching their audience, they want to increase exposure and engagement. Um, so does anybody here have like a dream company that they want to work for? That they can name off the top of their head if you're... Riot Games. Riot Games. Um, they just got named, I think, top employer by a publication, I think, right? By Forbes or Fast Company? Or something? something like that, yeah. Okay, yeah, I saw that in my Facebook news feed. Um, so why do you want to work there? Uh, my husband's a game designer and I'm really interested in the game industry. So. Okay, do you know about their employer brand? Yeah, they, so they want people who play their game and other games, even in their HR. Right, right. So yeah, little things like that even, reaching out to people in the same industry, people with common interests, right? That's another thing that you can do to bolster your employer brand. A lot of different tech companies out there, they're reaching out to techies too. Right? So they're reaching that relevant audience. Thank you for sharing. Choose one. Thank you. Starbucks. I always try to like guess mentally which one are you going to choose. Right? I think I knew that uh, UCSB over here was going to choose the Amazon. But <laughs> okay, cool. Um, so let me tell you how we do this at LinkedIn. And I think it'll give you guys an idea of what different employers and different companies are doing out there to try to build that employer brand. So this is an example of the typical path to hire for any employee out there, right? And it's very similar to the path of purchase. What talent acquisition and hiring teams are trying to do is they're trying to take this prospect right here, a candidate who's potentially either not considering, let's say Arrowhead, for example, as uh, an employer, or maybe they don't even know about Arrowhead as an employer. And they're trying to move that employee down this path to hire until they become a worker at Arrowhead, right? Now, how do we do that? On LinkedIn, first, we start with advertising. We want to make them aware that that company exists. So how many of you guys are active on LinkedIn right now? Go on there pretty often. Okay, good number, you guys. You guys have probably seen ads like this Every time you're on LinkedIn, every page that you go on, it's always on the upper right hand corner. There's an ad like this that says, Marie, think about joining LinkedIn. Picture yourself here. We have jobs in this position open for you, right? Now, the first time you see that ad, especially if you've never heard of the company before, you're probably just gonna move on. You're gonna go to another page, right? But it's that exposure that makes that ad really effective. What's gonna happen if you see that ad five times, six times, 10 times over the first month. Now you're gonna become very aware that this company exists, it's gonna pique your interest, and you're gonna to wanna to learn more about the company, right? Now you're familiar with that company, and we can engage you on different levels. With LinkedIn, what we do is we may display a job to you, or what Marie's team does sometimes is they send out what we call company updates. So they'll send out updates on their news feeds saying that we're hiring, or we just had an event like this, let's say maybe a company barbecue or something like that, right? Now, this candidate is interested, where do they go? They go to Arrowhive's company page on LinkedIn to learn more about what it's like to work there. That's where they have all the content about what their benefits are, that it's a great place to work, that they pay well, right? And at this point, after any candidate has taken all these steps, then Marie's team, they've done their job. Because this candidate, we can almost guarantee that this candidate is strongly considering Arrowhead as their next place of employment, right? They've taken all of these steps. They know all this stuff about the company. So from here, it's easy. We just have to get them to apply for a job. One of her recruiters is gonna reach out to them and hopefully eventually get them hired, right? Question <coughs> asked. Does LinkedIn naturally do the ad, or does the company have to pay for that push? That's a great question. So, um, with most websites or networks, companies do have to pay for the advertisement. Okay. There's a few websites out there that give them for free, but for the most part, companies are paying for it. So that's an additional 
be added to paying for their job ad just to be on your website, period? Right. Um, as far as talent acquisition sites go, um, in most cases, whether it's LinkedIn, Glassdoor, Career Builder, you're paying for almost every placement that you have. Okay. Right. So that's a good point because this employer brand, it's an investment, right? It's an investment that companies have to make in order to make a dent in that whole hiring landscape, right? Um, so companies have to be cognizant of that and they have to kind of like always weigh different things out there like um, their budgets, right? What the return on investment is gonna be, what the priority is gonna be for hiring. And if you guys get into talent acquisition and HR, this is gonna be stuff that you guys are dealing with every day, right? The reason, um, if you guys end up being recruiters, that employer brand is so important is because it's gonna make your job so much easier, <coughs> right? If you think about a company with a strong employer brand, they're getting people applying to their jobs automatically instead of having to go out and find those people, right? So. You can apply that to your personal professional brand too, right? I mean, ideally, if you guys have an amazing personal professional brand, you guys are blogging all the time, people know who you are, you're gonna have companies reaching out to you, like all those software engineers, instead of you guys having to go out and reach out to people for jobs, right? I mean, I think ideally, that's what we would all want. Any other questions? Just real quick, did they, yeah. um so you know how you said that that was advertised to this person, right? Mm -hmm. Based on skills and things like that. So right. do companies have the ability to, like on the analytics or data side, look at people that are saying, I have these skills and then you directly are only advertising to them? Or is it like within a location or how does that work? They do, that's a great question. Um, do you ask that because you have a background in advertising? So no, I'm okay. just curious. No, it's a, it's a good question. It's like really technical. So. Um, Thank you for asking. Um, so yes, most advertising networks, including LinkedIn, they have a way to target an audience based on demographics. Um, so <coughs> LinkedIn will do that by skills, by region, by what their current job title is, right? Um, there's two different ways to think about it. One is when it comes to reach, you guys can spread your reach as far and wide as possible, reach anybody and anybody out there. But usually what's more effective is if you have a target approach, right? We want to make sure that if you're spending dollars with us at LinkedIn, or if you guys are spending dollars with any other advertiser out there, that we're using that effectively. You don't want to send an ad up for a software engineer to a, you know, a, I don't know, a salesperson, right? That just wouldn't make sense. Yeah. Good question. Um, has there ever been a case where the client was like, this recruitment source, particularly LinkedIn, isn't working for them, and if so, why? Yes, definitely. <laughs> um, so I will say that for the majority of our clients, LinkedIn is, I don't know, let me ask you, Marie. I think, I'm biased because I work there. I think it's the best place where you can possibly advertise. Um, but there's a lot of different options out there too, right? Um, I think that for, from what I know, I would say safely probably about 90% of the companies out there, if we're doing things the right way, then LinkedIn is probably going to be the most effective platform for them, right? The 10% that fall outside of that are because they're in a very specific industry where we don't have the right audience on LinkedIn, right? Um, so this is something that we're trying to work on right now, but one of those industries is like hourly workers, right? So. We have a lot of them on LinkedIn, but we haven't really figured out the best way to reach that audience yet. Um, so that's a challenge, right? But for the most part, again, the other 90%, if we're doing things the right way, and if we plan ahead, if we're strategizing correctly, then we can be the most effective solution on LinkedIn. And how do you guys reach out to uh, recruiters? Because I know you guys have like a really big team, like section. And how do you guys reach out to them? <coughs> That's a good question too. How do we reach out to recruiters so that they start using our services? Yeah. Um, that's what the sales team does, right? Uh, I'm not on that part of the sales team. I work with uh, existing accounts, like Maurice County kind of Arrowhead, but we do have a whole team that goes out there and they're like developing leads, they're calling recruiting teams, um, and try to get them to start doing business with LinkedIn. Andrew, a lot of it too, um, so if you can answer your question, a lot of it is word of mouth. 
So the recruiting world, we're, we're very tight, right? We, we converse, we network, we socialize with others, and we a lot of it is just word of mouth. We'll talk to someone who's gone somewhere, hey, have you thought about LinkedIn? And it's gotten to the point where it's even a lot of sort of traditional boots on the ground advertising. Okay, mm -hmm. there you go. <laughs> Thank you. I'd like one thing I know is like, that's like the basic must have now for recruiters is like LinkedIn recruiters. Yeah. So I think that's one way that it might work is like without it, you're not going to be, you know, be in the contact box and the line. Because I know you can like filter stuff out and just yeah, definitely. The tool that you're talking about is it's, that's what it's called. It's called LinkedIn Recruiter. Um, and what it is is right now the LinkedIn that you guys use, you guys have visibility into your network, people that you're connected with, um, first party, second party, third party connections, right? Um, we have 400. I think it's like 440. Don't quote me on that. I think that's the latest number. A million members across the globe. If you're using LinkedIn Recruiter you get unlimited access to all of those numbers. So you can reach out to anybody, regardless of if they're in your network or outside of your network, you have the ability to message those people too. So after you find them, you can actually connect with them and start a conversation. Great question. Are you thinking yeah. about like getting into the recruiting field? No, I mean, we use it right now. Like I use it for my job, and then we like to heavily rely on it. Oh, really? What do you do? Uh, I use for team for recruiting. Oh, there you go, okay. Sweet. Um, that's awesome. So you understand all this stuff, you probably deal with it day in. Yeah, I mean like honestly, like I feel like without it, like you wouldn't have a lot. Like, yeah. You gotta have it. Like, totally. Awesome. That's good to know. Cool. Um, okay. So let's also take a look at some different employer brands that are really big here, right? Um, and we can think about what the story is that they're trying to tell. I think when you think about employer branding, what's usually the first one that comes to everyone's mind is, well, I think for most people it's Google, right? I think they're the ones who kind of set the standard um, of being an awesome place to work. They have crazy benefits. Uh, do you guys all know about their benefits? You should <laughs> Google it if you don't, know, right? They have like all this crazy stuff. They have incredible food. I think they have like haircuts, a dentist on site, massages, whatever. Who wouldn't want to work there? Awesome place to work. Um, but to a point that you mentioned earlier, which is really important, a lot of people relate Google's strong employer brand to their strong consumer brand. I can tell you 100% that is not the case. Their employer brand is so strong because they had to intentionally build and invest in that employer brand, right? They had to build all those benefits from the ground. They, don't, they didn't always have that program in there, right? They had to get the word out about how great it is a place to work, right? Um, and I'll give you another example. Are you guys familiar with the company Priceline? Okay, so this company has an amazing business model. I don't know if you guys follow stocks, but the last time I checked, their stock was about 1200 bucks, right? Huge. Um, and I think over the past, I'm struggling to remember this correctly, but I think over the past five years, they've grown by like 5X. So this business is solid, right? But what about their employer brand? I don't think I remember last time anyone was like, oh my God, I can't wait to get a job at Priceline. Right? <laughs> so they haven't invested as heavily in their employer brand, right? What are some other companies out there? Amazon is a good one, right? The employer brand is in. Right, they actually ran into a little hiccup probably about, was it a year ago, maybe yeah. like six months ago or something, where they had a lot of people leaving bad reviews on their glass door page, right? A lot of it was uh, <coughs> the Amazon warehouse workers, right? Mm -hmm. um, they but, like slaves. My cousin works there. Oh, she really? Awful. In a warehouse? Oh my goodness. <laughs> we should have had her come in. <laughs> Talk about what a bad employer brand is. Um, but you know what? Amazon actually did a really good job of turning that around, mm -hmm. right? So they actually kind of took that criticism head on. Um, they changed a lot of things in their house. Um, and now if you look at their glass door reviews, they're kind of like back into where they were before, right? So this is where you want um, to highlight the power of the employer brand and what kind of influence that an HR and talent acquisition team have over there. So actually I noticed with Amazon, because um, I applied for a position and they've been emailing me that they're engaging with me. So then um, they're at their peak season for, the, for hiring right now, but then they 
that they want to schedule an interview with me in January, and I've gotten two emails from October. They just like like reminding me or letting me know that you know they still have me in there. Mm -hmm. I guess in their thoughts or whatever. But yeah. then, and I know that this message is not like personally written by recruiter. I know they're sending this thing out. So I thought it was really cool how they're engaging with their candidates and their future candidates. Right. Totally. Yeah. Um, that's a big thing too, right? I mean, if you have someone interested or you're reaching someone out, you want to make sure that they stay interested, that they stay engaged, right? Because the reality is that this employer brand is a lot of times, it takes time too. And we know that a lot of candidates out there on the job market, they may not be ready to make a move ASAP, right? And then they even said that, you know, I know from this time you might get an offer, blah, 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 and all the rest, just keep going. Yeah. And I thought that was really, I guess, thoughtful and considerate. I don't know how to answer, but. Right, right, totally. Yeah, I think um, when we think about <coughs> the landscape, I guess you call it, as employees, I think that, I don't know about you guys, but um, for me at least, I have like a list in my head of the mm -hmm. top five companies that I would be willing to make a move for if the time is right. That time is not right right now, right? Because I'm happy on LinkedIn. But, I'm sure those companies would ideally, if I was their ideal candidate, want to engage me and kind of like keep me on the hook so that when the time was right, then I'd be willing to move over. And I, at the organization I used to intern for, they did that with their future, their candidates and their future, I guess, candidates who would interview. They really, they had a lead gen team as well. Right. And they really engaged with their candidates. Okay, cool. Yeah, always a good thing to do. I was just gonna Question. ask, um, if you don't mind sharing, like, where are the companies that you're looking to go for? <laughs> uh, there's a few out there. Um, I won't name them, but they're definitely like top tech companies. Um, companies, well, tech is, I'm kind of like a tech nerd, right? Um, so what I do, and this is something I think that we could talk about when we get into like personal professional branding, is to think about exactly what interests you and like what field you want to go into. Um, and then look at companies that are the industry leaders in those fields. Right? So for me, it's like tech. Um, so top tech companies out there, none of the big ones, right? Um, but good question, sorry to answer that. <laughs> um, and some other strong employer brands. Wegmans, has anyone heard of these guys? Small company there, a grocery chain but they got named as one of the best places to work. Eventbrite, does anybody know who they are? Smaller company too. They have a really strong employee brand. I think they're less than 500 employees. I think maybe, maybe a thousand at most, right? But they have a huge employer brand here in the Bay Area, which just goes to tell us, you don't have to be a giant like Google to have a strong employer brand, right? If you're purposeful about the intent, um, if you strategize around the kind of investments you wanna make, how you build that brand, right? that reach exposure engagement, then any company can build an employee brand. Um, Marie, how many employees do you guys have at Aerohive right now? 630. 630. Um, so we consider that like an enterprise kind of size client, pretty large, um, a bit larger than small to medium business, right? Um, not quite as large as Google, but Aerohive, they have a great employer brand, right? Does anyone know what they do? We make like Wi-Fi. Yeah. Exactly, yeah. So they make um, hardware, networking hardware. Um, in that field, Aerohive is one of the top companies out there, right? Um, Instacart, has anyone heard of them? Yeah. They do grocery delivery. Another small company, they have less than 1,000 employees. Um, huge employer brand, right? So just some different examples out there, of uh, some strong employer brands. And if you guys, again, get into that field, HR, talent acquisition, and this is stuff that you'll be wanting to think about all the time. Um, so what are these companies doing right? Same thing that we mentioned before. <coughs> Step one is to build your presence. Marie's company does that on pages like the aerohype.com page and on linkedin.com. They have all this content on their page that again tells people what it's like to work there. They have pictures of the office, video of company parties and what they're doing in the market and things like that, right? So they're building their presence all around the internet and offline too, I'm guessing maybe? Uh, 
It's some markets. Okay. Some markets, yeah. Cool. Like Portland, yeah. Mm. Now, what's step two? Building a business is like just the start. Right? Um, one analogy that we use a lot of it's kind of like if you just build your presence, you don't increase your reach. It's kind of like throwing a party and not sending out invitations, right? How are people even going to know that this page exists? So after we build your presence, what you have to do is you have to maximize your reach and exposure. And again, companies like Marie's and Airhive, they do this by having ads on LinkedIn, their Glassdoor page, jobs on Indeed, right? Different types of content on LinkedIn where they can reach different people and get those people onto that page so they can learn about what it's like to work at Arrowhead. And the last thing that they do, these are some really good examples from Instapart, that company I mentioned earlier, is to really engage that audience, right? Now that candidate, that potential employee is interested in the company, how are you really gonna draw them in? And with that, it's all about different types of content that you have that are really gonna hook them into the company and turn them from that person who's all the way on the left of the path to hire, someone who's potentially never heard of your company, to someone who knows that they wanna join Instacart or join Google or join Amazon, whatever it is. Okay, make sense to everybody? Any questions? Okay, so all in all, employer branding, this is why it's important. You can make candidates aware, receptive, more likely to respond, and more likely to apply. One important term that we always use at LinkedIn is automation, right? And um, so, UCSV, give me your name. Suki. What was it? Suki. Suki? Suki. Suki. Yeah. Okay, cool. Um, so right now you're using Recruit as a tool, right? You're reaching out to people, and trying to source all the time. Do you have any idea, let's say, if you sent out 100 emails, how many people would respond to it? Uh, around five. Okay, cool. Right. What company, can you say what company you work for? Uh, Catalyst. Catalyst. It's a software company? No, it's, uh, so we get hired by startups for okay. outsourcing. It's, so we do like all kinds of things. Maybe. Okay, cool. Um, so, Marie's company, do you mind if I share? Yeah what your email response rate is. Yeah, cool. I think it's around 20% because they have a strong employer brand. So they send out 100 emails because they've done all this stuff correctly. <coughs> they get 20 responses instead of five. Um, now think about a company like Google. What do you think their response rate is? I have no idea what it is, but I'm guessing it's, yeah, I mean like 80% or something like that, right? I mean, they reach out to someone, someone's gonna respond because they already know even before Google's reached out to them, that man, this is a company where I want to work, right? Yes, is question. like a tech industry like standard response rate? I think, great question. I think um, we, the easiest way to like generalize across all industries is that most companies want to be somewhere in the neighborhood of like 15% is good. If they can be above 15%, that's great. If they could be above 30%, that's like fantastic, you know, you're like a superstar. Um, so the automation piece, right? If we have a strong employer brand, you get more responses, people are more likely to apply. Just everything that you do as uh, a recruiter is gonna be much, much easier. And at the end of the day, this is the real kind of like business thing. All this stuff that we're doing is saving time, building warm leads, getting you guys pre-qualified leads, helping companies reduce time and cost to hire. This is like the real advantage and the benefit of everything that we're doing, okay? Now, let's talk about personal and professional branding. I think this is like, hopefully what you guys will get the most out of. Um, how much time do we have? We've got about a little bit more than 15, so. 15 minutes, oh my God, okay. So we'll skip through this yeah. really quickly. Um, the one thing I would say about personal and professional branding is to think about what you guys want to get out of this, right? Like, what do you guys want to be seen as? So for me, for instance, I'm on the sales team at LinkedIn, but 
I don't think I ever want to be seen as just the salesperson. I want to be seen as an industry expert or as a business consultant to my clients. So hopefully I'm doing that for Marie. But when you guys think about your personal and professional life, <coughs> you guys want to think about what do you want to be seen as do, right? Because it's kind of like your public facing representation of yourself. Um, so you want to think about what's your story, what's your objective, and most importantly for you guys, how are you guys going to get there? And just like consumer branding, just like employer branding, the things that you want to do are build your presence on LinkedIn, social media, different websites, maximize your reach and exposure through networking, connecting with peers, and engage your audience, being active, right? Doing blog posts on LinkedIn, you can post stuff, you can like, you can share. What time is the class in? Uh, 45, 8.45. Oh, sorry. Okay. So let's get into building the profile. Everyone want to like, you went over the last time too. I'm sorry, Marie. I'm going to start rushing through this. I apologize. Um, and if there's anything that we miss that we don't get to, Marie will give you guys my email address um, and feel free to email. Okay. So I'm just going to do like, how's Let's do this. I'm gonna blow through this super quickly and then we'll walk through it. Building a great profile. These are the steps. Add a professional photo, write an attention grabbing headline, draft a compelling summary, and make sure you complete all the different sections, your education, your work experience, examples of your work if you have it. Um, and you can always see, I think, the difference between a good profile and a bad profile. So does anyone here want to volunteer their profile for me to bring up? Okay, what is your name? How do I find you? Melissa. Melissa. Marwick, H-O-R. H-O-R. O-R. W-I. W. I. C-H. There you go, there's one. Okay, cool. So what I'd like you all to do is go into your profiles right now. And do you guys know how to get into the edit mode of your profiles? You should see a little blue button on the top right that says edit profile. Okay. We're making some changes to our site, so it should be on the internet. Edit profile, do you see that? Yeah. Okay. Um, really quickly, uh, how many of you guys already have a LinkedIn profile and have it like semi built out? Okay, almost everybody. Okay, cool. Um, so the first thing that we want to do when we're building out your profile is to add a picture. If you guys don't have one up yet, then you definitely want to do that. The reason is because we want to make sure that we can engage people that when they get to your profile, right? The picture is the first thing to see. It's the thing that draws the most attention. Think about it like, um, any other social media out there, Facebook, Snapchat, Twitter, right? If you land, let's say, on a company's profile and they don't have a picture, <coughs> then you just leave, right? So a potential employer who's landing on your profile too, if you guys don't have a picture, if it's not an engaging profile, they're just gonna go through, <coughs> right? So we wanna build out your profile so it has a picture, it draws people in. I'm gonna pull mine up also. Now, one thing a lot of people forget to do is to add a background photo right here, which I think is super helpful. Um, the way that you could do that is you can go right here to update background picture. Let me ask you this. Is this layout of the profile the same profile that you guys see? Mm -hmm. You guys see something else? This is what you guys see, right? Okay, cool. Um, so step one is to add a profile picture. Um, I think a lot of people have different opinions on what kind of picture to add. If it should be like a professional picture or a fun picture that talks about like maybe it's a better representation of personality. I think that 
when you think about your presence online, you're not going to make everybody happy all the time. There's certain recruiters or business partners, or whatever it is that you guys want to talk to, that are going to want to know about your personality. Then there's some who are going to be a little bit more uptight. They're going to want you to have a professional picture, right? Um, so I think just do what you guys feel is most comfortable. I think that's a best representation of yourself, right? Um, the background picture right here is is really important too. So you can see Melissa. You don't have to share. A lot of people forget. Right, to include a background picture. So it's just this generic page. Um, what you guys can do is go onto your profile and change that background picture. Am I spelling your name right? W instead of the L. So. so those are the first two things that you want to do, okay? Now, as we scroll down, <coughs> the other thing you want to do is create a summary for yourself. Um, I don't have one. You don't have one. Okay. Does anyone have a summary that they have up right now that they maybe want to read? Volunteers? Gift card? Don't forget I have those. <laughs> right? Who wants to go? Gift card is not compelling enough for this one. Okay. Uh, there's a lot of different ways that you could build a summary for yourself. I think the best way is a lot of people, first of all, use LinkedIn as just kind of like a mirror image of your resume. That's okay, but I think what's a little bit more effective is to give your LinkedIn profile content and information that people can't get from your resume, right? You wanna include color about your background, experience, things that aren't just like bullet points on your resume. And I'll show you what I have right here. I'll just read it. Um, I'm passionate about digital marketing, all things tech, and helping companies build out their dream teams. I'm big on learning, collaboration, and building long-term partnerships. But what I enjoy the most, which is true, is partnering together with my clients and helping them plan strategically to take their business to the next level. Um, so, in my opinion, I don't know if this is true, a bit more compelling than just saying, like, hi, I'm Andrew, I work at LinkedIn, right? Yes. Like for the summary, is there like a certain uh, like area you want to hit? Because I was like more professional. Uh, is it more like where you're trying to build your career, or should it be more like what you're doing? You know, again, I think it depends on what you're trying to do. So for I think the majority of you, it's probably going to be to try to find your next job. And if that's the case, you want to let employers know why you're a good potential fit for the company, right? For some of you, maybe let's say starting a business. Right? So you want to let potential business partners or maybe lenders or investors know why you would be a good fit for whatever they're investing in. Right? Others may want to just have, let's say, start a blog site, have a large presence on social. So you may just want to do something fun and engaging. So it should really depend on what you're trying to do. You should all think about, again, what that goal is. Uh, what your objective is going to be, whether it's to find a job, start a business, whether it's just to connect with people, and then craft your profile around that. Does that answer the question? Yeah. Definitely. Hopefully. Okay, cool. Um, now, when you guys are building out your profiles, you guys will have the ability to drag these sections to wherever you want. So you can put any section first, you can put any section last. Usually, what I think works best is if you start with a summary, and then you go into your work experience. Right? Again, I think for most of us, we're using LinkedIn to connect with people professionally to try to find opportunities out there. Um, to answer your question, Suki, like what do you want to do? I've seen a lot of people, if it's, let's say, a sales role, what they do is they put their sales awards at the very top, right? Or if someone is, let's say, trying to get a role in um, digital marketing or media, somewhere where like content is important, what they'll drag up to the top is different posts that they've made in the past, different content that they've published and things like that. Maybe different projects that they've created. Can we like put our school first? Because most of us are like, you know, having started like a professional career. Would that be like a better option? Yeah, definitely. <laughs> if you guys have worked any job, I would put that in. Even if it's a part-time job, I would do that. Um, and when you guys are thinking about 
what kind of content to include for your description of that job, it doesn't have to be like a resume where you're just listing bullet points of all of your accomplishments. Again, if an employee's interested in you, they're gonna get your resume anyways. This should be something that adds a bit more color. So when they land onto your LinkedIn profile, they learn more about who you are. So this is my description for LinkedIn. As a relation manager at LinkedIn, I partner with LinkedIn's enterprise clients to develop strategies to build their dream teams. I won't read it all, but it's just kind of like more of a snapshot about what I do. In my previous role, I talk about different ways I found success. I found the most success through strategic planning and thinking to uncover the most effective opportunities, keeping the focus on putting clients first and growing our business together as a team. Um, I worked for a long time in wireless. I like, um, was one of the few lucky people to kind of like help grow that industry from pages to regular phones, flip phones, to camera phones, to what we have right now, smartphones. To this day, I love LinkedIn, but that was the most fulfilling job I've ever had just because we made such an impact on the world. I include that in here. I tell people that that's the most fulfilling job I ever had and I had a great time doing it. So as you guys are thinking about all the different types of content sessions that you want to build out on LinkedIn, always think about what the objective is. If it's to get a job, what's going to draw employers in? What's going to make them think that you're a great candidate, right? Because we talked about earlier how you guys as employees have the power to choose, right, which company you want to work for. Don't forget that, which I'm sure all you guys know, all these employers have the power to choose all these different employees do. So how are you guys gonna make yourself stand out, right? That's really what we wanna do when we think about building your online presence. How do you guys make yourself stand out as a strong potential candidate? Andrew, because we have 10 minutes left, can you talk to the class quickly about two, I think, important things, which is the recommendations, right? So people endorsing, and many of us have probably asked to endorse others as others have endorsed us, maybe the power of that, and also um, um, the connect the connections, right? Um, is it is it uh, kosher? Is it uh, the norm? Is it uh, to our advantage to accept LinkedIn invitations from everyone in the world, or should we be selective? Yeah, definitely. Um, so recommendations, I would say these are very helpful, right? Again, a, pot a potential employer or business partner, whatever it is, going to go on your page so they can get a snapshot of who you are, what your background. Right. One thing that always helps them with that is recommendations. People who you've worked with before, peers, colleagues, other students who can say good things about you. Right. It's almost kind of like when you guys apply for a job, people are going to ask you for references. This is a way that you can put your references right on your profile, so they don't have to ask you. Right. So, if you know people who are willing to give you recommendations, I would reach out to them, and it's as simple as sending those people a note saying. Hey, Sufi, I've worked with you before in the past. Um, I know we did some great projects together. Would you be willing to make me a recommendation? And one of the easiest ways to get a response to that is to offer a recommendation in return. Say, hey, I'm on the market for a job. It'd be super helpful if you gave me a recommendation. I'd love to give you a recommendation too. And if you have the time to do it, I always think it's good practice. If you have the time, just make that recommendation to them first. Send them a recommendation if you've worked with them in the past, and then you can send a note saying, hey, you know what, I had a great experience working with you in the past, I just left you a great recommendation. If you have time, it'd be great if you could do the same thing and return the favor for me. Right. So that's a great point, Marie, very helpful. Yes? Um, I had a, I was after a LinkedIn presentation before, and they were saying how sometimes if you have skills on your profile that aren't really directly relevant to your work experience, then it might impact your profile when people are searching, like it might go lower. So I'm asking um, for like the recommendations, if you have like a lot of recommendations from people that you have like class projects with or something, can that like have an adverse impact on your profile or? Um, no, to my knowledge, no. Um, and as far as your skills, I don't think that's correct either. Um, it, it may be, but again, to my knowledge, it's not. Um, so recommendations, almost certainly no. With skills, the way it works is if any recruiter is doing a search, they're going to type in a skill. If you have that skill, you're going to appear in the search. If you have other skills on top of that, it's not going to like bump you off the search. If they're searching for, let's say, so 